Uh, and welcome everyone. My name is Vivi Darmiazi from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. Thank you for joining us today on our Careers in Peacebuilding talk story series. Uh, this event is also co-sponsored by Conflict and Peace Specialists at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Now I would like to hand it over to our professor, Dr. Maya Sutoro, as our moderator today. Maya, please take it away. Thank you so much, Wivik, and thank you so much, uh, Jose Barzola as well, for helping with our Careers in Peacebuilding series. And thank you to all of you who are here and interested in um, the stories of remarkable peace builders and um, what they have done to find path and purpose um, in our world from stories from which we can take inspiration. Um, so today we have the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Um, Kalpana Sankar, um, who was a nuclear physicist, which is extraordinary. Um, even more extraordinary is that uh, she made a commitment ultimately to work for greater peace, justice, and inclusion, uh, to build a community um, that nourished healthy financial inclusion. And this is a testament to her persistence um, and her vision. Um, she brought this unique and, and valuable perspective as a scientist to the realms of finance and development. And um, this innovation um, allowed her to infuse the world of finance with um, a scientific uh, curiosity and precision. And it enriched... Um, uh, her capacity to engage in social impact. Um, uh, Kalpana Sankar's um, initiation into development work began with the focus on eliminating child labor, um, but her visionary leadership swiftly broadened um, to include women's empowerment, uh, environment and climate, um, uh, life skills development, and public health. Uh, Kalpana is the managing director of the Bellstar Microfinance Limited, uh, which uh, is a institution with real social conscience that impacts over 2.4 million members. Uh, and those members have loans amounting to approximately 80 billion rupees, which is uh, more than a 1 billion US dollars spread across 18 states of India as of November, 2023. Uh, so uh, today we get to speak to this uh, remarkable woman uh, about her journey with science, uh, as well as social advocacy and the nonprofit world. Welcome, Kalpana. Thank you, Maya, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Oh, it's sincerely our pleasure. So tell us a little bit more about the uh, journey of coming to your current work. Um, this is the Careers and Peacebuilding series, which is designed to help um, people understand that the work of peace and justice is broad and and interesting, and there are myriad ways to contribute, and yours is certainly a unique way. How did you um, move from science into the world of nonprofit? I did my graduation in physics. Then I wanted to do my doctorate in theoretical nuclear physics. I did my coursework at Math Science. It's a very specialized institute. We used to have professors from Berkeley and Stanford teachers at the Institute. I defended my thesis at Presidency College where two Nobel laureates, Professor Subramaniam Chandrasekhar and Sir C. V. Raman had defended their uh, thesis. It was a nostalgic moment. I did not realize the value of my thesis until I read Einstein's uh, biography where he speaks about his involvement in Los Alamos project. My thesis was reviewed and cleared by Professor Lix of Los Alamos University. And it was a thrill to watch the recent Oscar-winning film, Oppenheimer, where they speak about the project in Los Alamos. So I started off as a nuclear scientist, uh, but the opportunities at that point in time were very limited. So I thought I'll specialize in radiation, did my internship at Cancer Institute, but I found it too overwhelming. 
I saw patients vomiting blood. I could not take it. Then when I got an opportunity to head Red Cross, I then I jumped at the offer. Uh, I felt I was cut out for that sort of a job. Uh, so yeah, later I have specialized uh, on microcredit when I joined the government because one thing is reading in the papers and in the books, but when you see poverty directly, then it impacts you in a different way. So that was the beginning of the journey. Well, that was a brave leap that you undertook. And we appreciate so much that your experiences um, led you to feel compassion and empathy and to ultimately dedicate your life to working for the benefit of others and community. Um, when you began that um, shift, how did it make you feel? And, um, you know, how has working in the microfinance sector and in community building and grassroots advocacy um, changed you? And mm -hmm. yeah, after 30 years of uh, specialization, I think I'm grateful for the unique experience. First few years I had the opportunity of working in the policy space. I was working with the Planning Commission of India, bilateral institutions and government. We were able to design large scale programs. And when I joined hand in hand, there were about a couple of part-time three people and some three full-time people. So uh, with the support from Percy Barnevik, our advisor and co-founder, we were able to expand the program across 10 different countries. Within India, we have managed to scale it up to 13 uh, states. Our team is very passionate and committed. And when you talk about Bellstar, it was a shell company when I purchased. Today, we are serving about 4.5 million cumulative figure uh, across 18 states in India. Uh, then when I, when I see children who were bonded or who were out of school, uh, leading a life of dignity, working in IT sector, having their own enterprise. It makes me, uh, I'm filled with joy. And similarly, in the beginning, women used to be very timid. Even when I used to, when we used to tell them, please open a bank account, to go to the bank, they used to be so afraid. Today, they are very confident doing digital transactions. They were illiterate, but they managed to um, give a very quality education for the children. Many of them are doctors or engineers. I think when you work with the poor, it changes your outlook. I'm a transformed person because uh, you cannot experience their uh, problems. So it makes you more humble and uh, more uh, patient because many things you take it for granted in life. Only uh, I think this project that they're working with the poor has transformed my life, I should say. Well, I... Um... For one, I'm grateful that you have um, been so dedicated and put so much energy into supporting women. Um, can I speak to you about that? You know, why is it important that our students uh, also still seek to support women? What is um, still lacking in terms of gender equality uh, and advocacy? And can you tell us more about the uh, landscape of women's financial uh, health and uh, overall health. Thank you, Maya. According to the recent uh, World Economic Forum report, both on gender gap as well as uh, gender parity, uh, we have a long way to go to catch up with the develop, uh, developed countries. Um, this is applicable to all the poor women in Southeast Asia. Women have, poor women especially, have limited access to education, health, access to finance, or even entitlements. And uh, that's the reason we feel uh, we should invest in women to bridge the gender gap. Then we have also seen, after taking one or two rounds of loan, they start worrying about other things which matter to them, like education of their children, or providing clean access to water and sanitation, and several women over the past 20 years have seen they have 
graduated from us being a small from small livelihoods to a medium sized entrepreneur they are able to, able to give jobs to other women in the village and few of them have become elected political leaders in the village so they are able to contribute to community development so we strongly believe if we invest in women we are able to influence the family members and also the community and not only that i think you realize there are marginalized women who need help even i am so grateful to you and maya for actually for this encouragement so first generation entrepreneurs need that hand the holding mentorship and encouragement they can help them with marketing they can also help them uh, manage the social media page apart from that i would say the biggest benefit for the students is the take away from these projects when you start working with uh, children or poor women like uh, you develop certain skills like all our staff members are trained in conflict resolution and negotiation to get one child out of labor our staff have to negotiate with the child first then the parents and then the local community teachers so it takes lot of effort to get the child admitted in school so these are the subtle skills which you learn and similarly when you talk about women's empowerment to get them into a group because we have to train them on uh, how to be, uh, arrive at consensus how to decide on the savings amount about their weekly meeting timing about conflict resolution how to prioritize loan i think these skills are very important for the future generation so i feel they should uh, get involved in women empowerment and uh, make the world a better place thank you kalpana i um i want to ask you um what makes your approach different I and mean, you have managed to grow significantly and swiftly and in so doing you've expanded your reach in ways that are powerful um tell us a bit more about how you did that and what makes your process method and mindset different perhaps yeah hand in hand uh, believes in integrated community development we have a five pillar program because we believe poverty is multidimensional we focus on child labor elimination women's empowerment uh, health skill development and climate change and uh, belstar focuses on uh, micro credit what makes our organization unique is the synergy between these two institutions hand in hand we, um, we mainly focus on women the other programs Uh, are also happening but uh, not at the pace at which women's empowerment is happening uh, when you talk about women's empowerment hand in hand provides skill training business coaching links them with the market and bellstar provides the credit i think this unique synergy between hand in hand and bellstar helps women to come out of poverty at a faster pace we have had several external evaluations where they have actually commented that the increase in income after our intervention was somewhere around 30% to even 90% in certain cases in addition we have also done a social return on investment study with iit chennai they pointed out that for every 1 rupee invested the return was about 42 rupees so that shows the impact of the program Uh, we have shown over a period of time that our program is not only scalable but replicable not only in india but across the globe beautiful um so before i ask a, a few more questions i wanted to invite um those of you who are in the room we have a um a, nearly 100 participants here um and i i wanted to invite you to ask your questions and we will do our very best to get to them um in the meantime i i'd like to um turn to um you as a peace building leader you know what has made 
you most happy in this journey? And what is your dream for the future? I'm uh, an introvert because basically because of the scientific temper, uh, I don't believe in promoting myself. Acquiring Bellstar was a major milestone in my life. I got it for a, a meager amount of uh, 2.7 million Indian rupees. Today, the net worth has increased many folds. More than that, I'm very happy because it has provided sustainability to hand-in-hand -hand group of institutions. We are employing more than 10,400 people. Because I did not promote myself, I was really surprised when I got three national awards. Uh, it was a very special experience. I also got to meet our Honorable Prime Minister. He felicitated all the awardees. That was a unique moment. Uh, I have taken several risks for global expansion. I have not had even a medical insurance. I have traveled to South Africa many times, Brazil and other countries. I did it because I was very passionate. Then when I got uh, the Global Award for Women's Empowerment, uh, it was felicitated by UN Women and Kingdom of Begra. And uh, they gave the award at UN headquarters on uh, International Women's Day in the year March uh, 19, uh, um, 2019. That was a, a very special experience in my life. I, my eyes were filled with tears when I got that award. And uh, for the future, I would like to, uh, both Hand in Hand and Bellstar, would like to deepen the services. And personally, for me, I would like to share my experience and knowledge with other people who need help. I've been invited to be in the board of an international NGO operating out of Washington. They are working in the area of uh, children and they want to share uh, my expertise. Thank you. Well, those awards are well-deserved and, um, and thank you for seeking to mentor and share your expertise with others. Um, I'd like to ask, ask you a couple of questions related to nonprofit leadership as someone who has co-founded nonprofits myself. I'm keen to mm -hmm. learn from you. Um, I know that uh, it takes more than good intentions and passion to run an NGO. Um, would you share with me, what, uh, with us, what are your key learnings from nonprofit leadership? Um, what is it important uh, to keep in mind as you not only start an NGO, but also sustain and manage it? Yeah, all of us get involved because of passion and commitment. Um, for the first few years, it's fine because no donor is willing to continuously support your cause. So at some point in time, you need to convert it as a social enterprise or you should have a for-profit institution to support your not-for-profit. It was not all that easy. I had to invest a lot in equipping myself for that sort of a journey. It started off in C with INSEAD. I did my social entrepreneurship program uh, with INSEAD. Then I moved on to Boulders. There they train uh, uh, not for profits in transformation. It was a three week course at uh, Turin. So uh, basically I got the training on how to transform a not for profit to a profit entity. Then I got a I got the scholarship from Harvard for strategic leadership uh, course in microfinance. That also prepared me about and I got insights about how to handle both the not for profit as well as for profit. And then this I was selected for the changing faces program by East West Center. Uh, only one person gets selected from India and uh, twelve persons globally. I should really thank East West Center because uh, that gave me a lot of confidence and even perspective. I got to meet great leaders like you and Amanda only through that program. So it's very special to me. After that, I moved on to do a two years MBA through Triumph. Uh, Triumph prepared me for managing the for-profit organization. Even in 2016, uh, there was a course on risk management offered by Boulders. I happily enrolled myself for that. Um, 
even during covid i did not stop uh, learning and equipping myself i specialized in esg through competent boards why i am mentioning all this is like you have to stay on the top whether it is for profit or not for profit you have to continuously keep equipping yourself only then you can actually uh, provide leadership to your team and handle projects on scale it is not easy to wear two different hats both uh, like uh, and the not for profit is about transformative leadership uh, both the cases some business principles apply like your uh, uh, your particular about results and productivity but the way you approach uh, in not for profit is totally different when it uh, and it took some time for me to internalize and then move on to for profit but over a period of time i've gained mastery in managing both the institutions on scale oh that's so fascinating and i'm i'm not quite there i'd i'd love for you to speak just a little bit more on on um how you balance financial gain and social welfare you know i in and um how you um manage to sort of build up um a socially conscious for profit endeavor can you speak a little bit more to to what that requires yeah um, before the financial year every year in the beginning i used to worry how will i manage uh, my cash flows for the next year how many people i have to retrench because people trusted me and joined the not for profit that at one uh, i realized at one point in time like donors will not support your project endlessly we have to convert it into a for profit entity and make it sustainable mm -hmm. i think uh, your we should be focused on what we want to achieve um, basically both that hand in hand and wellstar we have eminent board members uh, they are very particular about the synergy and the value creation because uh, uh, even in wellstar my kpis is on few financial parameters they don't tell me you have to spend this much of time in with bellstar this much of time with hand in hand they have left it to my wisdom so the, the synergy between hand in hand and bellstar that is what is creating value and to ensure that there is mission alignment we constantly we are um, undertaking studies like social impact study and also client protection to ensure that there is mission alignment with uh, between the two entities i think uh, have uh, adopting business principles or moving to a for profit entity i wouldn't say it is wrong because that only helps you to reach economies of scale and also deepen your outreach but uh, you must be very clear on what you want to achieve mm -hmm. so keeping that vision and mission in mind and probably rearticulating it as you grow and change to accommodate yeah. the increasing number of community members that are participating and seeking outcomes um and invested in your your mission okay. so yeah that's that requires a lot of agility and creativity i imagine I, another thing that must be pretty challenging is the diversity of geographic endeavor for you. I, I would love to hear more about your global experience. You handle women's empowerment projects in Brazil, Afghanistan, South Africa, Cambodia, and you know this. These are um, such unique and powerful cultures with wide ranging and. different needs um and how do you manage all of that and uh tell us more about your uh, journey of flowing in between these projects at uh, the first project which i managed outside of india was south africa it was possible because of percy banavik our founder and advisor he introduced me to tabo mebeki it was a uh, very special meeting the president of south africa uh, both of us also presented the road map of for south africa to the cabinet i got to meet uh, elna gandhi uh, granddaughter of mahatma gandhi uh, when i listened to her i understood the challenges faced by gandhi in 
in building peace and how he was also uh, able to inspire global leaders like Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mebuki uh, using the principles of non-violence and peace. So even my outlook changed. Then I felt whether a poor person was suffering in India or South Africa or Cambodia, it is the same. We should do our bit to make their lives better. So uh, South Africa, I had a lot of learnings and women also, like we had to train them, give them confidence because they were mostly relying on government grants and to get them into entrepreneurship took a lot of effort. The second project was with Afghanistan. Uh, when we set up Afghanistan just one week before, uh, two staff members of another global NGO, they were burned to death. So we were very clear that we had to be Sharia compliant and we had to follow the rules. Our uh, country director, she went and presented about hand in hand model at Blue Mosque in Kabul. 64 mullahs have participated in that meeting, uh, especially in Afghanistan um, those days. Before embarking on anything new, women used to consult the mullahs. So when they approached the mullahs and asked them whether they could join hand in hand, all the mullahs endorsed and they said, yeah, they came and explained to me, we uh, can join, it will be beneficial for you. So that was the starting point. And we also designed program for men because the same uh, training was given for men in terms of skill training, providing access to markets. Then they allowed the women to join the program. So we had separate groups for men as well as separate groups for women. And when the project concluded, the Minister of Rural Development thanked the Indian government for the services of hand in hand. And uh, it was also uh, became a forerunner to a very big um, uh, World Bank project, which was taken across uh, several provinces in Afghanistan. So it was a very successful project and an emotional one too. The third project which I happened to lead was with the Inter-American Development Bank. So they all wanted us to set up a pilot at Recife, Brazil. And then when I went for scoping, I was really nervous because there were very many very big institutions, microfinance institutions operating out of Latin America. I was wondering what I could actually bring to the table. After scoping, we realized that savings and linkages with government can be coupled with the microfinance program to make it uh, unique in uh, Latin America. It was very well received. And after external evaluation, the president of Inter-American Development Bank, he said it was the first case of success of South-South Dialogue. It did not stop with that. They also engaged hand-in-hand uh, in hand to train trainers from five other Latin American countries. They came on an exposure visit to India and the model was taken from Brazil to five more countries. Last to speak about Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia, it has a very young population, but the rich poor divide is huge. And uh, women work very hard and they're mainly involved in fishing, uh, animal husbandry or poultry. They have meager land holdings. Um, they're also in Cambodia, every street, if you see, there will be at least three MFIs. So we wanted to do something different. We introduced savings and internal rotation so that they could borrow money for consumption and medical emergencies. We also introduced skill training and linked them with corporates like SLR. Uh, the program is very well received and the uh, government of Cambodia gave us the SSG banking license after seeing our work at the ground level. So all the four projects have been very rewarding to hand in hand and gave us a unique position. Mm, that's extraordinary. Um... I marvel at your impact and uh, the ever widening spirals. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's powerful when you've created something that can be adapted and scaffolded in, in every place it seems. Um, and I'm glad that you are sharing some of this journey and process uh, in an upcoming book. Um, 
I'd like for, for again, the audience, um, you, many of you will be watching this uh, via recording after, but we do have 120 people in the room nearly. So um, if any of you have additional questions, um, please do put them in the chat. And I would like to uh, say thank you as well to Sahana Sankar, who has put in the chat a case study on uh, your work in Afghanistan, um, you know, linked here uh, uh, to YouTube. But um, as those of you who are here, um, perhaps note more questions, I'd like to ask a final question, which is, tell us about this upcoming book. Who are you writing it for? Why should people read it? Uh, what will you disclose in it? Tell us more. We look <laughs> forward to it. Many thanks, Maya, for your support once again. Uh, basically, I have set up 15 institutions. Uh, it has not been very easy. I've uh, faced a lot of challenges. Only my family, my family members have actually seen me uh, struggling with the different entities. So basically wanted to document the vision and purpose behind each institution so that our staff members and future generation will get to know about the great organization and the legacy for which it stands for. And basically I did, I uh, learned everything the hard way. I was neither prepared for the not-for-profit journey or for the for-profit journey. Uh, whatever challenges I faced, I think it will be helpful for people who want to uh, get into either for-profit or not-for-profit, they can take an informed decision right from the beginning. I also feel it will be very interesting to several students, academicians, bilateral institutions, which can actually see the synergy and replicate it in different geographies. There is so much of unrest, rich, poor, divide. We can... Um, actually learn from the model and make the world a better place. So I feel bilateral institutions, governments uh, will find it interesting. Uh, basically, uh, personally, if you ask me, I will be very happy if at least 100 social entrepreneurs get to read the book and if they are able to do projects in scale and make the world a better place. Lovely. Well, thank you. You know, my mother was... Uh committed leader in microfinance and in fact a pioneer <laughs> so um this holds this work holds a special place in my heart so i thank you <laughs> for it uh, we have a question here from erica nakanishi who says how have the women you support played a role in co-creating your interventions and how have you built monitoring and learning into your operations very good questions I specialize uh, in monitoring and evaluation when I work for the government. So from day one, we have been investing a lot of effort in monitoring and evaluation because we strongly believe uh, anything which gets measured gets done. So uh, women actually, they, they are generally very compassionate. They believe in uplifting others. So in a group concept, uh, the entrepreneur ones will lead and then the others will follow. So uh, it's about the leadership uh, qualities. We train women on leadership and also on the management of self-help groups. Um, several of them have be become successful entrepreneurs. They have saved money. They have created enterprises. They have also uh, recruited other women and they have given jobs to other women. The most happiest part is uh, they have employed their husbands to work for them. So that's a very big uh, thing in countries like ours where the gender parity is there. So husbands support them with marketing. Uh, basically, before um, embarking on any product, project, we do the baseline. So, and then we have a midline and an end line. So we do mid course correction and then External evaluations are done to learn about uh, uh, the outcomes of the project, what we have done very well, where we have failed. And we have been very transparent in sharing the findings with the donors and wider audience. Great, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Raju Bhatt. How do global political events 
affect your projects? Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, life is full of uncertainties, but we can always navigate and find our way through because uh, uh, sometimes uh, we have to uh, be very patient. Like uh, uh, in the not-for-profit sector, we cannot uh, expect results uh, instantaneously. So only through patience and negotiation, we can be successful wherever we want to operate. For a few years, we may have some setbacks, but we can always overcome through love and patience. Thank you. I um, know that we need a lot of both love and patience these days to deal with global events. But I must imagine that some satisfaction comes from seeing transformation at the deeply local level, seeing the faces of particular women. Um, and that must be an antidote to grief when you know mm -hmm. these big global events seem out of reach, um, which speaks to Julia Steele's question here. It is particularly wonderful to hear about the changes in women's lives created by your work. Um, could you share stories of one or more of the women um, who have been deeply affected um, by the work and who have deeply affected you personally? Yeah, two, three case studies I can share. Um, uh, we used to have a lot of uh, exposure visits. Uh, we had one, uh, we had a group from Afghanistan. Uh, there was an accountant. Uh, Every time when we used to have a uh, uh, delegation, I used to check on them the next morning. How are they doing? Are they healthy? Do they need any help? Because they are from another country. And they said uh, he was crying the whole night. So next morning when I landed in my office, I went to meet with him and speak to him. What happened to him, whether he was not feeling well, why was he crying? Then he was narrating his experience in his village. There were about 70 people and 69 people got gunned down and the bullets that the people who were shooting them, they ran out of the bullets and he was the last person. He just ran for his life and then he joined uh, hand in hand Afghanistan as an accountant. So he could not get over the trauma. So when you see people suffering like that, then you feel, then we used to give him a lot of confidence. You are alive, at least bring about change the lives of people, you can actually help. So that was one thing. And even during COVID, uh, several staff members used to say, because migrant laborers lost their jobs. Uh, this is about uh, uh, Rajasthan. Mm, I used to get reports from my staff saying, um, because all their entire family was dependent on the salary given by hand in hand. We never stopped the salaries of our staff even during COVID because we said, this is a time they need help. So sometimes uh, they used to tell me, we'll wait for this uh, salary to feed 14 mouths. So that was a very, uh, uh, I was very moved when I heard such stories. I also, one more uh, uh, person, uh, uh, many of them very young, but they lost their lives due to COVID. So, uh, and uh, a patriarchal society, women are not allowed to, mingle, go out, and then when they become a widow, lot of superstitions that they should not leave their homes for one year. But uh, without any income, how can they manage? So when we train them in tailoring, uh, when we invested in digital training and showed them how they could market using their mobile, um, um, and I came across uh, women uh, who, uh, her name, I think it was, was Tulasi Purohit. She had actually thanked uh, profusely um, the staff members of Hand in Hand for bringing about a change in her life. She was speaking about how she was using a phone for getting orders. She was a confident person. She had she was driving her own two-wheeler, moving from place to place. She was able to take care of her children after COVID. So several such case studies and Women who, are, uh, who were illiterate in 2004, today their children are doctors and engineers. So when they see me, they will tell me, don't think only your daughter is an engineer. Uh, we have, uh, my daughter is also an engineer. So that sort of a transformation, you know, it really brings tears into your eyes. Like 
see he little helpless people today they are able to lead a life of dignity and they are able to speak with confidence um, their mobility has increased they are able to negotiate with uh, powerful people and get their rights thank you for sharing that um uh, the next question um is what will you do differently if you could go through your journey again, all over again? What would you do differently? That's from Sahana. <laughs> uh, from day one, I would have actually planned for a for profit organization. I feel instead of 10 countries, we could have scaled up the initiative to 20 more countries because several places people are waiting for some help. And through microcredit, it's not only sustainable, it gives them a lot of confidence. Family members start respecting them. They learn how to negotiate. Their decision-making skills improve. They are able to influence the family members, uh, create an impact, and also impact the communities. So I think from day one, if you have uh, clarity on the for-profit approach, I think you can build synergy and the benefit a lot, a lot of uh, women and children. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good to keep in mind. Um, all right, our next question there, and there are lots of um, words of thanks coming into me, both through direct message and uh, more broadly in the chat. This next question is from Clifton uh, Esteban. Um, given Kalpana's experience in cross-cultural communication with different geographic areas, could she share a lesson on what communication training should focus on in order to promote peace? Um, context, my social enterprises focus on cross-cultural communication training and empowerment. So. Uh, thank you. I think uh, we have to invest a lot of time uh, before we embark on any global uh, experiment or starting to work with new culture because uh, people are different. They are afraid. So we should uh, know about the local culture, their habits, their preferences, and then prepare the team which is embarking on the journey through um, the right inputs for them to be successful. So that I learned after my China mission. We did not do that much of homework. Uh, we visited Kunming. We saw a lot of poor people, but our project, uh, we could not uh, uh, set up a successful initiative in China. After that, um, I started personally, I took uh, leadership coaching. Um, from um, uh, leaders who have worked in such environment, learned about the local cultures, what we should do and what we should not do, what things will be interpreted differently. We may, may mean the right thing, but people can interpret it differently. So I think uh, you have to engage with a local person, uh, get insights, plan for the communication material, and internally you have to work because you have to be ready to operate from that place and it takes time to gain acceptance it will not come from day one but over a period of time when they see your work and commitment people do listen and you can bring about a successful transformation mm. yeah we i we talk a lot about moving at the speed of trust which, uh, you know, is is different from community to community, um, but always requires that deep listening and um, connection with local folks. Great. Okay, so um, there's some comments in the chat that express appreciation of, you know, trauma-informed policy and consideration. Uh, there is um, a YouTube story, a Tulsi story um, is shared by uh, Sahana, um, and Madhu um, speaks to how inspiring um, it is to hear about your empowering uh, work, um, building communities of peace and justice. Um, 
uh, Li Ling asks, in your journey as a social entrepreneur, you must have tackled complex societal issues. Could you shed light on any significant public policy disputes or challenges you may have encountered while working in these areas? And how did you navigate them to achieve your goals? Very interesting question. Uh, when we started working with child laborers and when we used to go and present it to the government, there are this many out of school children in a particular village, nobody would accept the data. They used to say, most probably you're getting aid based on the number of children you showcase. So that was the first realization that the data has to be uh, accurate. We had to get the endorsement of the data from the uh, local authorities. And then when we took it up with the government, it was easy to influence their thought process. Uh, one thing which we realized when I started working for uh, children, uh, we brought about two changes. Um, there was a massive program called Sarvasiksha Abhyan. It was not funding the residential schools. Uh, when you work with child laborers, out of school children, uh, they need to be uh, as a part of a residential school so that um, we counsel them, uh, we meet their uh, uh, their uh, uh, aspirations and also understand their mindset and then prepare them to join a formal schooling. So we took it up with them and then they included uh, the residential schools funding also as a part of the program. One more thing uh, which we did was uh, when it came to child labor, um, people used to... Uh, um, take children for work 24 hours 7. Um, but uh, school admissions were limited uh, uh, to July. So when we used to get the children ready, we could not handle them because after two years, after, but the uh, schools were not ready. So then a landmark uh, with my government order we got in 2006, they said whenever a child is ready, based on the literacy levels of the child, the child should be admitted in the school. I think that has helped several children in Tamil Nadu get uh, admission in government schools. That was a major breakthrough. So wherever it is possible with data, we approach the government for policy level changes. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Manoharan. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, who is from Bellstar, it seems. What pivotal moments or challenges have you encountered during your journey that have profoundly influenced your leadership style and the direction of your initiatives? Sometimes uh, people don't understand why you're taking a particular decision. And uh, then I realized that communication was the key. Uh, when you take some... Uh, you are convinced about why you are taking a particular decision. You have to be uh, prepare a communication strategy, get the buy-in of all the people, and then only move on. So uh, people don't understand when you take some decisions, why uh, you're bringing about certain changes. So any change uh, you have to bring about, it has to be a process. You have to get the buy-in of different stakeholders and then move forward. So... I faced a lot of criticism when such changes uh, were brought in. And one more thing, uh, because of Percy Barnevik's uh, influence, I used to talk about mergers in the NGO sector. It was not heard of. So he used to tell me, there are small NGOs, why can't we support them and make our institution big? But uh, we failed in that experiment because people uh, were not happy with that move. They said, uh, you cannot actually merge NGOs. That concept is never heard of. So there were some backlashes. So we had to change our approach and focus uh, based on the backlashes. I don't know that that's true. In the I I I um, have a merged NGO, but I I take your your point. It <laughs> looks different, right? Uh, uh, in for profit and corporate spaces. Yeah. Um, the, the next question, your science background seems to give credibility to your visions. Is that true? Yes, because uh, uh, everything is based on data and uh, like you're very not judgmental. 
So you take an informed decision uh, when you go through the trend analysis. You're better prepared even to handle the different stakeholders. I think scientific positioning always helps. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the monitoring and assessment and um, the storytelling uh, that you must use frequently in order to sort of expand your vision and help people understand um, the work and and become part of the movement. Um, you know, can you share a little bit um, Someone asks here about um, the balance between quantitative and qualitative um, assessments, and you know how um, important is storytelling versus data. I think both are important. In the initial stages, I used to ask my advisors, uh, um, "Should we focus on few places and do a high impact program, or should we?" work in several geographies, then the impact will be slightly less. Uh, one of the advisors told me, many poor people are in need of dire help. So in the initial stages, they said we should expand. They will get at least some relief because we introduce them to government systems. We provide them basic access. But over a period of time, we should consolidate and focus on data to drive impact. I think it is very important. And uh, a communication uh, team of hand in hand and the monitoring and evaluation team of hand in hand, both of them are responsible for the results we have achieved today because they have been focusing a lot on uh, capturing the data and also presenting the trend analysis to different stakeholders to gain their confidence. So it is an independent department working to the reporting to the board and both of them, I feel uh, they are doing a lot of hard work and getting the stories, right stories, uh, um, uh, getting communic uh, communicating the right stories to the right audience to get them interested and also to make them get involved. Mm, beautiful. Okay, we have um, just a few more minutes. I don't see any more questions. Um, so perhaps we can play a speed answer uh, game. What say? <laughs> okay. Are you willing? Okay. So what is um, a country where you would like to see um, hand in hand, where you would like to see your work um, grow next? A Latin American country, Mexico, or any other place. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, what is your um, favorite uh, book? Favorite book? Uh, like all the autobiographies I enjoy because I learn a lot when I read about global leaders book on Michelle Obama, all that, uh, it really, uh, you make, uh, you become a global citizen when you read such books. Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, my next question is, what gives you courage? I think uh, um, I'm a, a strong believer in God. I think Almighty gives the courage because several uh, our processes can be right, but the outcome, I think he decides. Mm, okay, so that faith. And what is one piece of advice that you have received, perhaps from a mentor or an elder, um, that you value greatly? And uh, like, uh, you can never fail in a not-for-profit um, uh, if you have the right negotiation skills. Never give up till you reach the last child. So you be patient and work on it continuously. Mm. And what piece of advice would you give to my teenage daughters? Like there are a lot of opportunities today, we are better off, but there are several people who do not have access to basic amenities in life. We should always extend a helping hand and, and it makes you happy, it makes the other person happy. It's, a, it's having a multiplier effect. I think more people should spare some time on these uh, social projects. Hmm, agreed. What is one resource that this audience 
uh, should look into to learn more about this important work? A lot of uh, publications are available uh, uh, and uh, uh, research studies are also available on what work, works well in a particular geography. So before embarking on any journey, I think review of secondary data and continuously, if you have a particular about climate change, continuously, continuously we should keep reading about new innovations happening in that space, research is happening in that place so that you get to know uh, about the current uh, affairs. Mm, beautiful. Can you say a few more words about that intersection between um, climate and gender? Yeah, women are affected the most. Women and ch children are affected. We have seen that in tsunami. They were all, uh, uh, in 2004, um, uh, nearly 14,000 people died, and many of them were women because they were wearing saris. They could not uh, actually run. So uh, climate change affects uh, women and children because they are more vulnerable. Um, so we have to uh, prepare in terms of uh, investing in our time and advocacy and also taking the right uh, measures, uh, like whether it is uh, uh, cleaning up the ocean or also alternative uh, um, agriculture practices uh, and conservation of natural resources. I think we should train uh, more women so that more women should get involved as climate champions and take care of their local communities. Mm, very nice. All right. What is uh, one thing that all of us here, um, not just the 122 people in the room, but also those of us watching this as a recording afterward, what can we do to support you and this work? Uh, please tell us where we can um, reach out because we have a good model which has a track record and we have committed staff who are willing to work in any part of the world. I think uh, together with all your support, we can make the world a better place, expand hand in hand to regions uh, where we can create a shared value. Beautiful. And if there is someone here who wishes to reach out to you, um, is that information readily available on your website? Yeah, now that after this uh, podcast, we will ensure that the information is available so that they can reach out to us. Great. When was the last time uh, you felt really hopeful and why? Uh, the success of Bellstar gave me a lot of courage because uh, um, um, after the pro handling projects in Afghanistan and Brazil, I felt confident about the approach we are following in the not-for-profit. Recently, I think Bellstar uh, should be touching uh, uh, AUM of uh, 1,000 million uh, rupees uh, by March 31st. That's our goal. We are working towards it. Or the entire team is focusing on that. I think... Uh, that makes me feel that I have achieved something even in the for-profit world. Oh, thank you. Well, we have come to the end of our webinar. I will say I have learned a lot and been inspired. We have um, the contact uh, info at high... Oh, hand in hand. So it's info at hihindia.org. It's all one word, hihindia.org. Um, for those of you who cannot see the chat or any of the socials at www.hihindia.org. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this time. And I want to thank uh, again, Jose and Wiwi uh, and the Matsunaga Institute for this careers and peace building series. I hope that all of you uh, will consider yourselves part of the Matsunaga Institute family and come back for future um, programming. And until then, please be well, be healthy, and thank you for all that you are and do. Aloha. Aloha. Many thanks, Maya and team, for this amazing opportunity. We welcome all of you to visit India and see our projects and strengthen the collaboration.
Uh, we will surely do that. I know I will. Thank you, Kalpana, for your um, exceptional work. And, and thank you all.